Good afternoon. My name is Susanna Gurr, and on behalf of the team here at the BC Center for Employment Excellence, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on Accessibility for Specialized Populations in One-Stop Employment Centers. For those of you who are not familiar with the BC Center for Employment Excellence, it was created in 2012 with funding from the provincial and federal governments to act as a research and knowledge sharing organization for BC employment service providers and employers. The Center's mandate is not only to do innovative research, but also to find ways to share that knowledge and best practices with BC practitioners and employers. We created this webinar series as a way to reach out and connect with practitioners. Through this series, we have been highlighting new research by the Center but are also tapping into the knowledge and expertise within the employment services community. You're invited to view the video recordings of previous webinars that we have posted on our website. I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today, Wendy Bancroft from It's About Us Research. I've had the pleasure of working with Wendy on several projects. Wendy is an experienced interviewer, film producer, and researcher. Wendy specializes in approaches designed to explore the why and how questions. Her professional history includes work as a project director with a major public opinion research firm, several years as a senior research associate with the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation, and a television journalist and film producer with the CBC. For the past 10 years, she has owned her own company, It's About Us Productions, specializing in documentaries with an employment focus. Some of you may be familiar with Wendy's recent work. She produced the stories for the Center's Learning from Practice series, which clearly shows her talent in combining research and videography. If you have not seen these stories, I encourage you to go to our website and take a look. It will give you a glimpse of Wendy's talents and her ability to combine rigor and creativity in her work. Before I turn it over to Wendy, I have a few housekeeping items. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes. Due to the high number of participants, we will be muting the audience throughout the presentation to ensure audio quality. We encourage you to use the questions feature on your dashboards to submit any comments and questions. My colleague Greg will be compiling the questions for Wendy to respond to throughout the presentation and we will leave about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for further discussion. We are recording the webinar and will post a video on our website along with a link to the presentation slides with further opportunities for everyone to continue the conversation. With the high number of participants today, we might not be able to address everyone's questions during the webinar However, the blog will be a great place to continue to engage with the Center and Wendy and other practitioners. If you lose your connection during the presentation, please reconnect using the link emailed to you. If you lose your phone connection, redial the phone number which appears under the Info tab and rejoin. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Wendy. Thanks, Susanna. Hi, I'm glad so many of you could attend, and I hope that you leave this webinar knowing that you're doing lots right, but maybe with a few new ideas. And I just lost my <laughs> timer here, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of the next 45 minutes. So first I'm going to start by providing a little bit of context for the study, why we did it and how we did it. I'm going to talk very briefly about the employment program of BC and also briefly about how one stops operate in other jurisdictions. And then importantly, what we learned about what works best to support job seekers with challenges along the pathway to sustained employment. I'm just going to be touching on highlights in this uh, webinar. Uh, there is a reference report that includes much more detail and that can be made available to you. So very briefly, the Employment Program of BC is a one-stop approach to providing employment services for all job seekers in BC. EPBC was implemented just over two years ago, 
All job seekers can access a range of services through the WorkBC Employment Service Center in their catchment area. And in each WorkBC Center, there's a lead or prime contractor who partners with several subcontractors who deliver specialized or alternative employment services. The study was prompted by interest from several sources wanting to improve access for job seekers with specialized need. This includes the Ministry's Expert Advisory Panel on Specialized Populations, career practitioners that were surveyed in a report commissioned by the Center for the, pardon me, for the Center for Employment Excellence, Skill Requirements for BC Career Development Practitioners. In this report, many career practitioners felt unprepared to support specialized populations. And finally, the need for more information about best or promising practices emerged in the round of consultations the Center did with practitioners throughout much of the province. Okay, what do we mean by accessibility? It is, of course, physical accessibility, as in facilities and resources that facilitate access. But it's also ensuring the job seeker is aware of and participates in relevant services and programs. And it's very much about treatment that is inclusive, respectful, and helpful. In EPBC, specialized populations are defined as job seekers who may require additional supports to accessing employment services in order to meet their needs to achieve the desired outcomes. Importantly, Job seekers who fall under specialized categories make up two-thirds of those actively in case management, and they tend to be the long-term unemployed, they tend to have limited work skills, they tend to have little or no work experience or education, and to have low levels of self-esteem, motivation, and confidence in their competence and in a positive outcome for their efforts. So what do we hope to achieve? Well, we wanted to learn from others with the same or similar one-stop approach to employment services and with more experience about what had worked best for them. Three countries were explored, the UK, the US, and Australia. All of them have a longer history of one-stop approaches than BC. We also wanted to produce a resource for providers and practitioners to contribute to capacity building to support specialized populations in their pathway to work. We sought to understand the following kinds of things. How do one-stops work in the three jurisdictions? How are they organized? What has changed and why? How is it currently working? What are some of the things they do to ensure that job seekers are aware of and use employment supports? What are some of the best ways to ensure that harder to employ job seekers get the kind of support they need? What practices and strategies work best when it comes to job retention? And what are some of the things that make a difference in how well sites work? How did we do it? Well, I won't go into everything here, but basically we did a literature review, and I'll just say that there is a vast amount, actually, of literature out there about, this, uh, about best practices and about the, the uh, one stops and how they operate in three jurisdictions. I ended up with a pile about eight inches high, so what I decided to do was to focus on the studies and literature that was most recent, and you see what's, what's here. So. And I will say that studies evaluating various initiatives and what worked best about these approaches for job seekers were very helpful. We also, or I did, a key, a key informant interview round. Um, it was a snowball approach. We began with some of the primary evaluation researchers and uh, talked to them about uh, the approaches in the various uh, jurisdictions. And that spread to key people and national provider organizations and to people at the operational level. And then, of course, there was an analysis of the findings. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time describing how one stops operate in each of the three jurisdictions. And again, you can find out more information about each of them in the reference report. All of them share a system that's based on entry through a single gateway, all are directly linked to benefits. All are structured in terms of a payment by, by results system. All use private contractors, both uh, profit and nonprofit. But after that, there's some pretty big differences. 
One stops have been around in the United States since 1998, when the federal government introduced an act that mandated that every state integrate services into one-stop centers. Working with a governing board, a prime provider runs the one-stop and, if necessary, refers job seekers on to one of a set of mandated partners, including um, unemployment insurance, adult education, veterans employment and training, vocational rehabilitation, post-secondary vocational education, and there's more. But other than this structure, there's much flexibility at the state and local level, with the result that what happens with specialized populations varies according to local priorities and resources. These job seekers can be referred to different funding streams with, within the system, like vocational rehabilitation, and then that is subcontracted uh, to job coaching, supported employment, those kinds of services. Community-based organizations may address more of what are considered the non-vocational barriers. There is strong advocacy support for the harder to employ, and they must be represented at the board level. But their payment by results system doesn't prioritize outcomes for specialized populations, and so there are some pretty large disparities between employment outcomes. The UK has been experimenting with one-stop systems since the late 90s, with the work program actually being the latest of several major reforms. Clients apply for benefits through government-run offices that combine employment support with income support, and they're just located down the hall. They're expected to begin looking for work immediately. If job seekers haven't found work within 12 months, they're then referred to the work program, where they're randomly assigned to a prime provider who, working with subcontractors and others in their supply chains, has two years to get that person into sustained employment. As of last month, they are only paid when sustained employment, which is usually defined as six months, has been reached. Two or three prime contractors are located in each area in order to promote competition and drive up performance. Prime providers have complete flexibility to innovate, and there is a definite focus on those who are harder to employ. But according to a recent system evaluation, the work program has not been well suited to assisting those with a disability or facing complex or multiple needs. A large proportion actually ended up returning to the Job Center Plus office. Claimants with complex or multiple needs felt the support they were offered was not tailored to their personal needs and circumstances. They felt it was more important to deal with a particular barrier they're facing, like homelessness or health issues, rather than quickly moving them into work. The UK looked to Australia for ideas in setting up the current model, but there are some substantial differences. In Australia, anyone applying for income or EI benefits is mandated to look for work. They enter the system through a Centrelink office, but if eligible, they're then assigned to a private contractor and they must begin a job search within 48 hours. Job Services Australia was only implemented in 2008, but Australia actually began contracting out employment support services in the 1970s. At that time, it was focused on specialist cohorts, but broadened to all job seekers by 1998, setting the practice of outcome-based contracts that gave providers flexibility to personalize service provision. There are two substantial departures in JSA. The first is a star rating system. Provider performance is based on two key performance indicators, employment outcomes and speed. And increasingly, there is a third indicator relating to intensity of engagement with job seekers that's not actually formally part of the star rating system, but it is used to determine future contracts or in the determining of future contracts. It's a highly competitive system. There are 100 organizations delivering 650 contracts in 116 employment service areas. There are always two or more providers in any employment service area. Their outcomes are all compared, and if a provider is falling behind, they lose the contract. The other major departure in JSA was the designation of job seekers into four streams of need, which will be familiar to people working in EPBC. The stream four job seekers are defined as being the most disadvantaged, requiring integrated, intensive assistance to overcome multiple vocational and non-vocational barriers to employment. 
and it's important that the two things are, are noted here. It's vocational and non-vocational. And importantly, the more disadvantaged the job seeker, the higher the weighting in the star rating system. So there's much innovation actually that's happening for the stream right now. In a comparison of labor markets in seven countries undertaken by the OECD in 2013, Australia is actually cited as being the most effective of seven OECD countries for well-designed policies that get more people to work and thus reduce benefits paid out. That doesn't mean that there isn't criticism of the system there, and it doesn't mean that they're also not looking at ways to improve what they're doing. Having said all this, since July of 2013, JSA only applies to mainstream Australia. Most of Australia, all that part that you see in the dark yellow, falls under what's called remote Australia, where roughly 85% of job seekers and communities are Indigenous. Since July of last year, this huge region, and it is a huge region, has been served by what is referred to as a prime plus subs model, very much like EPBC, replacing most of the mainstream providers with local providers. There's definitely more community buy-in, but much of the new staff is inexperienced and is currently a very intense capacity building project underway that we'll talk about later. And finally, on to the stuff that you've been waiting for. Understanding that the client experience is formed at many steps along the pathway to finding and keeping a job, the practices and strategies that are discussed here are discussed as they fit in this pathway. And I have had to leave out a couple of steps. There are a couple of steps dealing with marketing and messaging and information that aren't here, but they are in the uh, reference report. Best practices come from lists compiled by advocacy organizations in the United States and from the key informants, but most of what you're going to hear comes from research in Australia that looked at all sites and grouped them into high, medium, and low performing according to the star ratings, but also ratings according to job seekers on the quality measures of provider capability, service delivery, client experience, and engagement and also a series of best practice guides, guides based on strategies used and lessons learned by providers delivering services to the most disadvantaged workers, the Stream 4 uh, workers, in 20 Job Service Australia demonstration pilots. And fortunately, we are able to draw upon examples from the stories that Susanna mentioned earlier on the Centre's website series, Learning from Practice. I want to emphasize that these strategies and practices are offered as suggestions only, a way to see what others are doing and consider whether this is something that might work or even be necessary within the EPBC context. Some, if not many, of the practices that are to follow may actually be commonly or already be commonly used by some, if not all of you in your sites. And. We're not going ahead. There we go. Physical access is uh, mostly about the facility, but part of accessibility is getting there. If the job seeker doesn't have a car, it will be important that the center is located along public transportation corridors. When they get to the center, it needs to be ex an accessible physical space, of course. This means all routes outside and inside the building have to be accessible. There needs to be a clear line of sight to important elements for any seated or standing user. There needs to be adjustments to mitigate fatigue, like having adjustable chairs, desks, and tables for workstations and classrooms. And elements need to be arranged to avoid inadvertent errors, so for instance, having automatic document backups and fixed settings on public computers. Overall, there needs to be appropriate space to accommodate people with limited mobility. For instance, ensure that there's a clear path of travel and that getting to the service or person that they're heading towards does not require going up or down stairs and that there's sufficient room for wheelchair seating and maneuverability. And again, more detail in the reference report. While the goal for WorkBC sites is to have job seekers who feel comfortable making use of services at the site, sometimes that's not feasible. 
for example, in geographically isolated communities without transportation, or in populations where the discomfort level involved in coming into a mainstream site is just too much. In those cases, other approaches are needed, in fact, taking services directly to the clients. For example, staff in the Open Door Group's office in Vancouver's downtown east side have found they are much more likely to reach persons on probation if they take services right to the downtown community court. Similarly, because some of their client base live in very isolated areas without public transportation, case managers from Stolo Aboriginal Skills and Employment Training take services to those communities. In New York City, the Community Partners Program sends job blasts to community organizations who then refer job-ready clients to the One Stop for specific job openings. There seems general agreement that the most effective method of reaching out to the harder to reach population is through community-based organizations such as civic organizations, advocacy groups, faith-based and community-based entities and neighborhood associations. The HOPE project I'm just going to talk about is an example of an initiative funded by the Australian government and intended to develop a set of tools and best practices for collaboration between employment providers and a major community-based organization. Homelessness is a huge issue in Australia. The government decided that providing crisis beds was not enough. They had to break the cycle through service interventions, one of which was moving homeless people into jobs. And it's not easy because of attended issues that can include things like mental illness, family breakdown, and substance use. These are people unlikely to access mainstream employment centers and not disclose they are homeless even if they do. The HOPE project was an attempt to see if a collaboration between the main provider body, NISA, and the main body seeing to services for the homeless, HA, would work as a strategy, with an immediate goal of producing a set of tools that could be used by those working in either homelessness or employment services. So each entity began by conducting research on the other to understand what each other's context was. What were their views on homelessness? What were the kinds of issues that they faced? What, in fact, were employment prospects available? And their experience and views on collaboration. They then moved on to establishing common ground and principles and working out ways of collaborating. It was not easy. There were challenges having to do with things like trust and willingness to share. Nevertheless, agreements happened and there were various working relationships formed from joint case management to co-locating staff. According to Marg Lurie, a senior policy advisor with NISA and former manager of the HOPE project, establishing common ground and principles early on is important so that the focus is on what you're trying to achieve and that can support you through other things you need to do. Be clear about each other's roles and expectations and you need commitment to collaborate at the front level, but you also need commitment from the high level in the organization too, because you need your people doing the day-to-day -day operation to feel confident, especially with performance pressures. Now, the whole project is not uh, ongoing now, and it actually wasn't expected to, to be, because the main thing was to produce some resources. And what they've done is produce two kits, one for people working in employment, and one for people working in homelessness, uh, and a, a number of other resources like the 10 Steps to a Successful Collaboration. And with their permission, we have actually downloaded these from the NISA website, and they can be shared. However, let's just assume the job seeker comes to the One Stop Center. When a client enters the WorkBC office, the first person they usually see is the staff behind the front desk. So this initial contact is very important. It sets the tone for ongoing participation, or not. The greeting should be welcoming, respectful, and helpful to everyone. No one more or less than another. Suggestions to support access include the following. You could post a staff listing that includes photographs of staff members because individuals can forget the names of staff they've worked with, and this visual reminder allows them to connect with the person they've worked with before. You could provide a pad of paper and pen at the front desk, along with a sign indicating that customers who are deaf or hard of hearing can write down instructions for the receptionist. 
And according to the administrator of the One Stop Center in Skagit, Washington, something that they found very helpful with job seekers who don't speak English is having a chart at the front with all of the flags of the world. So the person then can point to the flag from their country and then the person at the uh, front desk can call a translation service. It is the greeter's job to get a sense of the person's needs and capacities and then direct them to either the resource area or line up an orientation and case manager. When there's an obvious disability, this, this can be straightforward. More challenging are the times when there are hidden vulnerabilities. Even very experienced greeting staff can miss hidden impairments in health conditions. And of note is that roughly one-third of job seekers with disabilities within the EPBC have mental health issues like depression, bipolar disorder, and ADHD, and these can be very difficult to spot. Bruce Stafford, one of the evaluation researchers that I spoke with, and he's quoted on the right side of the screen here, says he suspects the proportion of invisible disabilities is much higher. This initial triage assessment, and we refer to it as triage because this is the initial sorting that, to, to one thing or another, it can be crucial for what happens for job seekers down the line. Job seekers with undetected vulnerabilities who are referred to a, to a resource room for a self-directed search can become discouraged and give up. And even though there is a second opportunity to triage in the resource room, that may not happen in a timely manner and can lead to time wasted and increasing frustration for the job seeker. So best practice strategies include awareness training to gain sufficient training to spot the hidden vulnerabilities at intake, or WorkSource Skagit has actually taken a slightly different approach. There what they do is qualified staff take turns manning the front desk, and in this way there's less chance of missing someone with an invisible disability. And again, the report includes quite extensive lists of best practices for the resource room and for orientation, uh, but I haven't included them here. Although if we have time, I think I actually did the list of the resource room. We can maybe look at that at the end. It all begins with that first crucial meeting, case management we're talking about now, a critical time for establishing the client-staff relationship and setting the tone for upcoming activities. High-performing sites connect with job seekers more quickly and engage more frequently than medium and low-performing sites. This is especially the case with the Stream 4 demonstration pilots where the case manager might meet with the job seeker on a weekly basis. In addition to keeping the employment goal front and center, this approach provided a sense of structure for Stream 4 job seekers who often have no routine or structure in their home life. Practitioners also tend to report spending longer on average on the initial contact and assessment, spending between 30 minutes to over an hour with Stream 4, the most disadvantaged job seekers. Taking longer gives job seekers time to open up and time for the provider to make sure the job seeker knows what's involved in this relationship, including information about compliance and assessments. Site managers do their part by finding ways to support this by reducing the case manager's caseload and or by sharing the load among a case management team. Importantly, staff must have good interviewing skills in order to get needed inf information while maintaining an atmosphere of trust. Good interviewing skills include the following. Ask the kind of questions that require more than a yes or no answer. Think of using words like describe or explain or how. Ask follow-up questions, probing for more information. If the question asked does lead to a yes or no answer, ask a follow-up question asking for an explanation of the yes or no response. Be judgmental, period. Nothing makes a person shut down faster than a judgmental response, whether verbal or nonverbal. And speaking of nonverbal, be sensitive to body language. Look for things like eye contact and how the person is sitting. For instance, are they facing away from you? Are they looking down? And finally, be open to learning about new interviewing approaches like motivational interviewing. It's an evidence-based method designed to engage and enhance motivation that's been found to be particularly helpful when working with clients who resist change. 
Now, from the job seekers' point of view, when job seekers were asked what mattered to them, they said the following. They prefer to work with the same practitioner if possible. Having to tell their story all over again can be discouraging and emotionally difficult. And they want that person to treat them with respect, to be friendly and polite. And the latter was especially true of uh, new immigrant uh, job seekers that were interviewed. They also want that person to be ready for their initial appointment, prepared to spend time and effort with them, uh, an interaction that should be personalized and not process driven, who seeks to understand their individual circumstances and who adds value to their own job search efforts through things like having detailed knowledge about the local labor market or other government programs. To make sure you're getting the best service fit and spotting hidden complexities, it's recommended that the practitioner use supplemental assessment tools such as the ones that you're currently seeing on the screen. Consider going a step further and arranging for, more, for a formal diagnostic assessment. And think of screening for a possible non-apparent barrier, not as a single event or tool, but as a process that may take place at many points during program participation. Just say that according to practitioners in the Australian Stream 4 demonstration pilots, job seekers consent to and appreciate having the assessments because it gives them a sense that their needs are actually being addressed. Importantly, the employment plan should be developed and viewed as a joint plan, a contract between the provider and the client. High-performing sites tend to treat the plan as a living document, visiting it frequently with the job seeker, where the document becomes a framework for discussion, a way to track progress, achievements, and motivate further action. Training or work first, the big question, and this jury is still out. There's many studies pro and con here, but with some believing that attaching to the labor market's number one, others arguing that fast into work is not necessarily the best outcome for low-skilled individuals. There does seem general agreement that an approach that focuses on outcomes over process does work best, but that especially for job seekers with more complex barriers, some level or kinds of vocational training produce better outcomes. Additionally, that pre-employment supports work best when tied to specific employment needs, when there are definitely jobs at the other end. To say that higher performing sites spend on average a higher proportion of their allocated funds than low and medium performing sites, but they spend the funds on things very directly related to the employment goal. Courses are geared to recognized in-demand qualifications. The most useful outcome of case planning may be referring the job seeker on to another service or to a counselor offered by a partner agency. So it's very important to have a clear understanding of what your partners do as well as your clients' barriers. It might be necessary to reach out to specialists in community-based organizations who may have a deeper understanding of barriers associated with specific population groups. Of note is that several one-stops in the United States have taken on disability program navigators to assist one-stop staff by providing awareness training, information, and resources specific to client needs. Developing organizational collaboration is one of the key activities being tested in the Australian Stream 4 demonstration pilots, and two primary engagement models have emerged. Joint case conferences and sharing information in which providers establish communication protocols with external organizations or invite these organizations to participate in joint meetings or make presentations to job seekers. And case management teams that may include staff from several organizations or might involve co-locating staff in the other organization's venue. Now we turn to some strategies for finding and keeping jobs, the role performed in BC largely by job developers. I have to say that much that has already been said about engaging with job seekers applies for job developers. The two roles, as you know, are highly interdependent. Job developers are employer-facing. Employer it's a term that signals a shift from looking at job postings to cultivating relationships with employers, letting them know about available incentives and supports, but also learning more about employer work environments and workplace needs. Three recommended strategies are 
reverse marketing, that's working with employers to identify unmet needs in their workplace, and then marketing individual job seekers to these employers. High-performing sites use this as part of a broader strategy of developing and maintaining employer relationships, but they are very careful not to oversell the job seeker. Sector marketing. This approach focuses on developing in-depth knowledge of sector needs, including training needs and building strong relationships with employers in that sector. This approach is being tested, uh, actually it's been tested quite a bit by the Center for Employment Opportunity in New York City, with results that show higher rates of job placement and higher wages than participants served by the traditional model. And you can see in the quote in the right is uh, from David Berman, who's Director of Program Management and Policy for the New York City Center for Economic Activity. And what he says is that they have a whole one-stop now that's focused on transportation and manufacturing industries, another on health care. Another strategy is social enterprise job creation. This approach would see government as an employer of choice and an important part of employer-facing activities. This is more controversial. There are some people who don't think that this is the route to go, but EARN, which is the Employer Assistance and Resource Network in the U.S., argues there needs to be hiring initiatives in place to support the employment of job seekers with disabilities into state and or municipal employment. Other innovative strategies include using software that links skills. So this would include the use of online vacancy boards where providers will use proprietary software to scrape jobs from a variety of sources and, prevent, and present them in a smart way, like linking skills required for a particular role to keywords in an applicant's CV. Using social media to connect with younger job seekers, like jo email blasts to sites like Twitter or Facebook, or having information on web pages and blogs. All of this can keep clients aware of new job openings or relevant workforce programs and services. And something the top performing sites did if they do not have sufficient caseload to meet employer needs or to meet the minimum number of participants for training courses or activities was to network with other providers. And such a network exists, of course, in British Columbia. It's the Job Developers Resource Network, or JDRN. And there is a video story about this network on the Learning from Practice web series. As systems have moved to measuring performance by outcomes, job retention has become a huge focus. There are many examples of post-placement supports for workers, things like wage subsidies, subsidizing personal protective equipment or transit or work clothing, job coaching or income supplements. Post-placement staff support can range from simply checking in with clients to see how they're doing to more intensive on-the-job coaching. High-performing sites use a higher proportion of their allocated funding for wage subsidies than do lower-medium performing sites, but they focus on selling the job seeker, not the subsidy, which is used only as a final selling point. The Stream 4 demonstration pilots are looking at ways of improving post-placement support for up to 26 weeks, including such things as out-of-hour support for job seekers that could include informal meetings at a coffee house. In some cases, there is support for up to 52 weeks based on expected need for these job seekers, many of whom have an undiagnosed or unstable disability or medical condition and face significant non-vocational barriers. The pilots are all still being tested, but early learning suggests that one benefit of the intensive post-placement support is that providers are able to identify and address emerging issues before the job is in jeopardy. As this quote says, sites vary greatly in their organizational details, in the operating environment, how they approach the client experience for a variety of reasons. It's the collective impact of many factors working together, so there is no magic formula, but there are definitely some things that make a difference. High-performing sites are more likely to have a positive, problem-solving attitude to find innovative solutions to the problems they encounter and make full use of the resources available to them. They're likely to have business practices that lead to meeting budget and contractual requirements to support the coordination and flow between subcontracted partners to establish linkages with community organizations and, importantly, 
to support the development of staff capacity. And it's with this last point in mind, I want to turn to the initiative I alluded to earlier, building capacity in remote Australia. Remote Australia makes up 86% of the total land mass of the country, but it's home to only 3% of the population, most of whom are Aboriginal. There are limited work opportunities in the community, and job seekers in remote Australia have low expectations and a long history of disengagement with employment service providers. So, a year ago, the government implemented a new approach to providing employment services, the Remote Jobs and Communities Program. It's a prime plus subs model, similar to what exists in BC, but the subcontractors are not co-located. It's been a difficult ramp-up period. The new providers are locally based and more culturally appropriate, but there are some serious capacity issues, which include governing boards that are elected from the community but with no experience of governing or managing contracts, prime providers with no experience of managing subcontractors, and no understanding of business models, including legal contracts and financial modeling. There are interagency issues arising from new contractual arrangements that have seen established providers without a contract or subbing to the new provider. And there are issues related to understanding roles and responsibilities and what's required and needed when it comes to service delivery. NISA, the peak body for the Australian employment services industry, does a lot of capacity building. When it became clear that there were issues with the program in remote Australia, the government called NISA in to undertake a capacity building initiative. It's very comprehensive. The initial focus is helping prime providers understand things like the funding framework and other aspects of the contract. Also, what's involved in service delivery and roles within that delivery. Once there's a better understanding of those things, attention turns to the frontline staff. In many cases, organizations don't have experience in allocating caseloads. There are situations where there may be three staff. There could be three to 400 clients allocated to the site, but there's not an assigned caseload. Supporting service delivery includes addressing labor market realities. Providers are asked to identify work opportunities in the community as well as fly-in, fly-out opportunities. It's not preferred for the job seekers to fly out, of course, so social enterprise is something that they're also looking at there. And finally, contractors who worked in the old system, which was more process-driven, are now struggling in the new performance-driven model. So the band that you see on the right of the screen is actually from the NISA RJCP, or Remote Jobs and Communities Program, uh, capacity building website. It shows the range of capacity building that they're taking on there, and they have also produced many capacity uh, raising tools. Now, very quickly in the next one, you're not going to be surprised to hear that we highly recommend keeping good data. If the goal to improve employment outcomes for job seekers, it's crucial to understand how the story varies according to particular populations and particular approaches. What is it about the process that works best? What worked best for clients with mental health issues? What worked best for new immigrants? What is the message or approach that resonates most with employers and is most likely to lead to sustainable jobs? And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, what keeps job seekers, especially those facing significant employment, employment barriers, engaged in the process and motivated to per persevere? So, just to end off, the field is constantly evolving, new initiatives are being tried and tested, more reforms are on their way. All jurisdictions are trying to provide a consistently high level of services across the board so that there's no wrong door. The reality is, some variation in delivery is to be expected. In a study looking at the relation between program effects and outcomes, the study authors point to organizational attributes including strong leadership, organizational resources, and staff capacity, culture and climate, and the involvement of an outside monitor or fixer as key outcome influencers. And that's it. Thank you. Hope what you've heard leaves you feeling good about some of the things you're doing and inspired maybe to try some other things. And as I've mentioned several times now, there is a reference report that provides more detail, including some of the things I had no time to discuss in this webinar. And Susanna will let you know, I guess, how to get that report. Right.
right. We're actually in the process of finalizing the reference document, and we hope to have that ready by the end of June or early July. And when that happens, we'll put, post it on our website for sure. Thank you very much, Wendy. And I'm going to turn it over to Greg um, for any questions. Sure. Thank you, Wendy and Susanna. And we actually uh, don't have any questions that have come in yet. So uh, we still have a few minutes, uh, almost 10 minutes, actually. And if you have any questions about the presentation, uh, we'd be more than happy to take those now. I just want to highlight, um, Wendy uh, mentioned a few times, and I think it's quite um, you know, relevant, and I think people are aware of it, the importance of partnerships and how it affects and the collaboration and then being able to identify solutions collaboratively to complex problems. I think we've heard that in numerous consultations, and it's come up, you know, um, many times in the research that Wendy's looked at. So I think that's a really important point. It takes time, and, it's, and to do it well, it has some very, you know, um, powerful impacts. Um, and given that we've got some time, Wendy mentioned you mentioned earlier that you've got some more kind of references or documents that you may go back to to share some of the items for um, accessibility or facility that um, maybe you can take a few moments right now to talk a bit more about it. Which, which would you resource for? Okay, just a sec, let me get down because that's done on the... Uh -huh. Right. All right, guys, I'll be right with you. <laughs> Um, I do have the resource room uh, somewhere. Okay, Susanna, do you want to talk a little bit while I look for the well, resource? Think, yeah, it's up on the screen. It's up on the screen. So. All right, so you can see it there. All right, so yeah, there's some interesting things that came up here. Um, there's a little bit of overlap with some of the in, uh, information that was shared about information actually about uh, messaging and si uh, how you signage and things like that. Um, so color-coded signs for each area, piece of equipment. You can just read this actually. In, in, using images, thinking in terms of text and verbal, for instance, uh, in, like in orientations, not just talking to, but also using uh, graphic displays. Um, I'm wondering about... Uh, in messaging also, this was another area I wasn't able to get at, or I didn't get at today. There's not a lot of information actually about marketing, but one of the things that, that they do stress is that there have to be multiple options for people to access information and to access the centers. So for instance, um, not just the website, and by the way, if you have the website, one of the things that they suggest is that the information must not be all jumbled together. It's got to be really clear. There's got to be space. It's got to be clean. Uh, it's got to be accessible. Then the navigation on the website has to be really good. Um, but also, for instance, using having kiosks in um, shopping malls, that sort of thing. And on the kiosks, there have to be really clear graphics, so that sort of thing. Thanks, Wendy. A question that's come in, uh, and I'll just read it off right now. Can you recommend research that speaks to what models work the best for individuals with a disability? For example, is the one-stop the best model? Was there any research that was undertaken on that relates to that question? Yeah. That's a hard one because um, pretty much everything I was reading, of course, had to do with why the one-stop. Um, I think the one-stop is actually thought of as being a pretty good model. I I think the question possibly is more within one-stop services, um, what is the best way of helping people with specialized conditions? And uh, frankly, I think right now, and you probably noticed it from 
the weighting I was giving to certain information, what's coming out of Australia is probably the most helpful. They have the longest experience of working with specialized populations. And by the way, in addition to the TUNISA, which is the peak body for the, the mainstream providers in, in Australia, is another organization called Jobs Australia, and they represent all the nonprofits and specialists. So I think it, that's what it's more about. Does that make sense? I, w I wanted to add to it. I think um, in one of the slides, Wendy, you put in there the navigator um, in the U.S. Right, yeah. and and they are working within the one-stop employment um, centers. But it's also their way of being innovative and what do we do, how do we organize ourselves so we can serve um, people with disabilities better and they're taking on the approach of having the navigators um, and there's some pretty interesting and promising I think practices that have come out from that demonstration. Yeah, that's coming out, the uh, disability program navigator, uh, the information I found about it was coming out of the uh, Institute for Community Inclusion, uh, which is located in Boston, the University of Massachusetts, but it's a large advocacy organization. And it is, I think in the states really it's the advocacy organizations that are doing the most, uh, they are really they're strong, they're very strong, and they really are doing a lot for supporting uh, employment services for people with specialized needs. Um, it's just that the system itself in the states doesn't seem to provide the same level of priority and weighting for um, supporting people with specialized needs into employment that it does in, uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, Wendy, we've had a couple of questions that have come in about the division of some of the different roles between case management and job development. Um, did you find anything in your research uh, around innovative practices for uh, for taking on these different roles? So, for for example, um, one practitioner has mentioned that she is struggling doing um, employer engagement and um, some of the case management for for example for customized employment services at the same time. Um, so you mentioned. For example, you're talking about the, uh, some of the different roles and the importance of, for example, the resource person in the front, um, the receptionist or the, the, the front uh, door person in welcoming the client. Are there any, anything, is there anything that you found in one-stop centers for innovative ways that um, the different roles are divided amongst the staff? I'm just trying to remember. There's a, I had a list, and I'm sorry, it's just not coming to my mind, but there, it breaks into specialists, um, specialist roles, like for instance, there are stream specialists um, in some, well, okay, where this comes out of is that in Australia, uh, I mentioned that there can be, there has to be more than two providers in, a, in any area, employment area, but how they organize themselves within their, their organizations is up to them. So for instance, there can be a generalist provider and they may have one or two disability specialists on their staff, but others have things like stream specialists and um, uh, specialists for particular uh, needs, that kind of thing. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah, thank you. And it's another uh, question that came in about, about specifically about the billing for um, the models in Australia uh, specifically. Um, are, is, it a, is it a paid model where it's based on each individual job, as is the case with WorkBC centers? So is the billing done, the first part of the question, is the billing done, um, from, what you, from what you learned, uh, by the case management team? Uh, and is it, uh, in Australia, um, a system that is based on uh, billing uh, and, and payments for number of jobs attained and services provided? You know what, I don't have that level of detail at all. Um, I mean, I can break, I can tell you what the, uh, give you more information about what the indicators are and how they're used uh, to determine, but I don't know about particular billing by project. No. Okay. All right. And it looks like we're almost uh, at the end of our hour today. So uh, on behalf of the BC Center for Employment Excellence, I want to thank Wendy Bancroft again for the presentation. 
um, lots of information and again uh, we will be posting both the recording of this webinar as well as the slides uh, later this afternoon and you'll receive the follow-up email tomorrow morning. Um, we have found that the system does not record those of you connecting only by phone as having attended. So you may receive an email saying that we're sorry you were unable to attend. If that's the case and you would like confirmation of your attendance, please contact us at the address in the email. And as always, we welcome your input and feedback. We would also appreciate any suggestions you have for future webinar topics. A few quick announcements. Uh, one main announcement before we end today's session. We were just uh, literally minutes before this webinar uh, confirming a date for our next webinar. We will be taking a break in the month of June, but we're very pleased that we'll, we will be welcoming Dr. Ruben Ford uh, of our colleague here at the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation to present results from the Motivational Interviewing Pilot Project. And again, that will be on July 23rd. Please keep an eye on our website and our newsletter uh, for announcement about registration. Okay, I think I may have lost the audio connection there for a second, so I apologize for that. But I was just mentioning that, uh, as you can see here on the slide, our next webinar will be on July 23rd. Uh, and that ends our webinar for today. So on behalf of the BC Centre for Employment Excellence, thank you and have a great afternoon.